Hello friends, welcome back to our channel. In today's video, we are going to discuss something very important. I will share some tips to select an FPGA board for any application. And if you are also searching for an FPGA board for your application, then this video is going to be very important for you. And it will act as a user guide to select an appropriate FPGA board for your application and in your budget. Now without wasting much time, let's get started. How do you select an FPG board for your application? Let me mention few of the points that I seek in an FPG board. And the first and the foremost important point is cost of the board. We cannot neglect it because cost of the FPG boards varies heavily. There are boards available which are very low end FPG boards and some of the boards are really high end FPG boards. So we need to choose them wisely. And the second point is number of logic cells. So this is very important parameter at the time of choosing an FPGA board. And number of logic cells depends upon the FPGA device mounted on the FPGA board. Each FPGA device has a limited capacity and that capacity is denoted by number of logic cells. Although there is no direct correlation with the gate count with the number of logic cells, but still you need to make an estimate of number of logic cells required for your application. Usually I get this estimate of logic cells by implementing my RTL code into the FPJ tools for an example Vivado. So that tool will give you exact number of logic cells required for your RTL implementation. Friends, if RTL of some of the modules inside your design are not ready, then try to get this estimate of number of logic cells by implementing those modules which are already available. Now I'm moving to the third point. Third point is connectors available on the board. FPGA boards are made to interface with the external world for sure. And each FPGA board has some or the other type of connectors available on it. For an example, some of the FPGA boards has PCI connectors available on it. And even the PCI connectors are of different types. So FPJ boards with different type of PCI connectors are available in market. Similarly, some of the boards has USB connectors and other type of boards has 100 gigabit per second Ethernet connectors available on it. Some may have 40 gigabit per second Ethernet connector available on it and so on. So you have to choose which type of connectors are required for your application. Now moving to the next point. Number of single-ended and differential I.O. pairs available for your use. This is very important point. Before buying any FPJ board, you must know how many I.O.s are available for your use. And the fifth important point that I seek in an FPJ board is I.O. standard support. We all know that FPJ fabric is programmable. But nowadays, I.O.s available with the FPJ device are also programmable. We can configure any I.O. as per the I.O. standard requirement. Now let us move to sixth point. And the sixth point is number of GC, MRCC and SRCC I.O.s. GC stands for global clock pin. So there are some specific global clock pins available on each FPGA device from where the clock can be routed to any of the clock region. MRCC multi-region clock capable I.O. From MRCC I.O. pins clock can be routed to few of the clock regions but not to all. SRCC is single region clock capable pin and if clock is applied at this pin it can be only routed to single clock region inside the FPGA device. And the seventh important point is high speed serial I.O.s requirement. In almost all the high-end FPGA devices, there are some specific set of IOs which can operate at very high speed. They are all called high-speed serial IOs. The general purpose IOs has a limit on the operating speed, but high-speed serial IOs can operate at very high speed. If your application requirement is that you want to transmit or receive data at a very high speed, then you definitely need high-speed serial IOs. And along with the FPGA device support, you must see 
the proper connector available on the FPGA board for high speed serial IOs. And the eighth point is HR HP IO availability. HR stands for high range, HP stands for high performance IOs. Actually, IOs are of two types. One type is high range IOs and another type is high performance IOs. High range IOs can operate at almost all the operating voltages. Whereas high performance IOs cannot operate at all the operating voltages. But HP IOs has higher performance as compared to HR IOs. So as per your application need, you must see how many HP IOs or how, how many HR IOs are required. And accordingly, you should choose your FPG port. Friends, there are other important differences between HR and HP class of IOs, but that is not the subject of our video. So we will cover them in a separate video. Now let us move to ninth point. And the ninth point is very important. It is on chip memory requirement, especially for DSP applications like FFT, etc. Friends, FPG has two type of on chip memory. One is called block RAM and another is distributed memory. So how much memory is required in your application? And according to that, you should choose the FPG board. Tenth point is XADC requirement. Some of the FPGs has XADC hard coded inside the FPGA chip. XADC stands for Xilinx Analog to Digital Converter. If in your application there is a need of analog to digital conversion, then you may seek this feature. In some of the FPGA boards, FPGA devices may not have XADC available inside the chip. On those boards, ADC can be available on the board. So you should choose the FPGA board according to your application requirement. For your information, another very important function of XADC is to monitor the temperature of the FPGA chip and the supply voltage. And 11th point is any other hard code IP requirement. Friends, these days FPGAs are not just only the programmable fabric, but inside the FPGA chips, there are many hard code IPs. For example, PCI blocks, Ethernet IPs, DSP IPs, and many more. So while choosing FPGA board, you must see the FPGA device features. And in FPGA device, you must see how many IPs and which type of IPs are hard coded inside the device and accordingly choose the FPG board for your application. For your information, those type of IPs are usually hard coded, which require very high performance and which will be difficult to implement by programmable fabric. And if they are implemented in a programmable fabric, they will consume huge area. Twelfth point is hard core or soft core processor requirement in your application. If your application requires the processor to be hard coded inside the FPGA devices and specifically it should be ARM processor, then you must go for Zinc device where ARM cores are hard coded inside the FPGA devices. These devices are a bit costlier, but they are very effective. If you have a soft core processor, then you can easily implement it in a programmable fabric. And for your information, Xilinx also provides free soft core processor with the name Microblaze. You can choose that processor as well. Thirteenth point is differential routing availability. We know each FPGA device has many general purpose IOs and each IO can act as single ended IO. But for your information, a pair of single ended IOs can act as differential signal. So we can use the pair of single ended IOs for transmission of differential signal. But that is only possible if on the board there is differential routing available. If differential routing is not available on the FPGA board, even if your FPGA device is supporting differential signal, then you cannot use that pair of single ended IOs as a differential signal. So differential routing is must to utilize all the single ended IOs as a differential signals. Fourteenth point is IO voltage requirement. Usually we know that there are FPGA banks and each bank inside the FPGA is a set of IOs. And to each bank, we need to apply a supply voltage and at that supply voltage, all the IOs operate. For example, to one FPGA IO bank, we supply 3.3 volt, then that bank will operate at 3.3 volt. And let us assume that to the second IO bank, we are supplying 2.5 volt. Then in that case, all the IOs corresponding to that IO bank will operate at 
2.5 volt and to get this supply voltage usually on all the FPJ boards we have regulators available and to choose which regulator should supply the voltage as a supply to the IO bank we usually can have jumper setting or some programmable chip available on the FPJ board but the regulators does not supply all the voltages for example one regulator may be generating 1.5 volt another can be generating 1.8 volt and the third can be at 2.5 and the fourth can be 3.3 but sometimes it is not possible to get the entire range so you must see whether the FPJ board and the regulators available on, on it are serving your applications requirement fifteenth point is external memory requirement and its type if your system is complex and it is processor based and on-chip memory is not sufficient to serve your purpose then definitely you require a bigger memory external memory we should be on the board so usually we choose DDR memories and DDR memory has different types for example DDR2, DDR3, DDR4 and according to your application you should choose which type of memory you require and check the specification of the FPJ board and accordingly choose the FPJ board. Sixteenth and last point of this video availability of external resources on the FPJ board for an example SD card slot, Ethernet file and USB file etc. Friends there are other important features that you should consider while buying an FPJ board and the first one is switches you should see how many user switches are available on the board and are they enough for your application and another important parameter is user LEDs you should see how many user LEDs you need for your application because LEDs are very important to indicate any condition and in some application it is seen that you need some type of LCD display and in some applications you may need seven segment display and apart from the above mentioned features you may need some SMA type of connectors which is very important SMAs are required sometimes to feed clocks into the FPGA boards or sometimes high speed signals into the FPGA board and apart from them sometimes we need burst sticks if you are not aware of burst stick just type on google burst stick and go to images you will see what is burst stick friends now I am going to discuss with you the most important point that you should never ignore and that is the availability of daughter boards for various protocols daughter boards are the cards that can be connected to the FPJ board because it is not possible to implement everything on single FPJ board so FPJ board manufacturers create these daughter boards for various other protocols for example if your board has some USB 5 on into it and it is serving your purpose for the time being but in future if you need Ethernet 5 that should be connected to your FPJ board then various daughter boards are available in the market you should see whether your manufacturer is building the daughter boards or no this is a very important point I think these are the only points that were coming to my mind and I have mentioned everything and if there is any other parameters that you see while buying an FPGA board please write it down in the comment section and we can discuss it there and with this I am going to end this session and I hope that this would be quite informative session for all of you and in future also we are going to create many such videos so to be aligned with our channel don't forget to subscribe it and press the bell icon to get the notification of all the upcoming videos thank you so much for watching